Okay, we'll go ahead and get going. Um, I'm gonna flip this one more, oops. Okay, uh, so welcome, like I said, my name is Deanna. Um, a couple of housekeeping things for us. We do have a student panel coming in, uh, or going to be broadcasting at 5.30 on February 15th, that's offer day. Um, so hopefully by then you'll have checked your email, you've gotten a notification whether you're um, you've been admitted or if you're on that wait list. Um, so we'll have that webinar. You can register um, on the future students page of the um, VetMed website. Also send something out um, when I send out the recording for this or for this webinar too. So, um, so you should be able to access that. We do have a YouTube channel now where these videos are going to be, um, you'll see videos about um, diversity and inclusion here at Iowa State, as well as just some kind of um, general promotional sort of videos. Um, so if you could do us a favor um, and go to Iowa State University College, uh, sorry, Iowa State University Veterinary Medicine um, and subscribe, that will um, help us be able to actually have a link that we can put out instead of the, the weird URL that um, YouTube is giving us right now. So, um, so then another housekeeping thing, you should see it somewhere on your screen, a Q&A box um, where you can submit questions. Um, what we'll do is we'll have Julia um, share her information and then right at the end, um, we'll answer any questions that, that weren't answered through the presentation. So we'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, and what we'll do with any unanswered questions is um, we'll go ahead and kind of filter through those within the next day or two um, and get you answers to that as well. So, um, so yep, utilize that question and answer box. Um, and we will go ahead and get started. I'm going to hand it over to Julia. Sounds good. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Julia Guaybu, and I am a financial literacy advisor here at Iowa State University. So we'll spend the next 30, 45 minutes or so going through some of the financial information. So how much does it cost, how to pay, how to get financial aid accepted, all of those kind of steps. Um, like Deanna mentioned, feel free to put those questions in the Q&A box and I'll get to those at the end. Um, so first of all, some of the uh, unique program that we have here at Iowa State. So I work part of the financial aid office, but also in the student loan education office. So the student loan education office is part of the overall financial aid office, um, but we saw a real need to educate students on money management. So that's the office that I work in. Um, I can counsel on all the general financial aid topics like your FAFSA, your loans, those things, but I really focus more on money management. So budgeting, loan repayment, credit, debt, all of those things. Um, and myself and then Tara Joyce, um, who also works in the financial aid office, we both go out to the College of Vet Med every week. I go out on Tuesday afternoons and she's out there on Wednesday afternoons. Um, so if you do come to campus, we'll be there. We're there to answer any questions you have um, for one-on-one -on -one counseling meetings. But in the meantime, you can see our email address and our phone number there as well. So we're a great resource for you as you're thinking about how to pay and then definitely when it's getting closer to that graduation from Mark about how to repay any loans you may have borrowed, looking at your starting salary, making a budget while you're in school as well, is something that I help with a lot as well. So we'll go ahead and get started um, looking into some of the cost information. So hopefully you've seen this on the website, but it breaks down the, the cost between resident and non-resident. And you can see the main difference there is the tuition and fees. Everything else looks pretty standard. So at the bottom, it says that total cost of attendance. So that's what we're estimating that it'll cost you to attend Iowa State as a veterinary medicine student for one full year. So a fall and spring semester combined. So you can see the tuition and fees at the top. And this is based off of this 17-18 school year. Um, it may increase for the 18-19 school year. We won't know that till a little bit later, but for now you can just go be safe to kind of assume that it's gonna be pretty similar to what's on the screen. Um, we build in housing and meals, and that's from a survey that we send out to the veterinary medicine students every couple years. Um, it's based on what students in the program are telling us they're spending on housing and meals. Um, we don't expect you to live in university apartments. Um, if you want to, that's perfectly fine, um, but many students choose to live in off-campus housing, either apartments, renting a house, whatever you choose to do. Um, but we assume it's gonna cost you about 8,800 for the year, to live in and feed yourself. Um, 
If that cost is not on your university bill, which it probably isn't going to be, you can still use aid for it. And we'll talk about how that refund process works. But basically, you would get half of that money in the fall and half in the spring. And then it'll be your responsibility to make sure it lasts throughout the semester. So uh, when coming to Ames, it'll be a good idea to use that number and really budget in what you can afford to rent or where you can afford to stay um, near campus. Um, for books, about $1,000 for the year, you can see, once again, that's from a survey that most students are telling us for books and supplies, about $1,000 a year. That's not always split 500 each semester, um, pretty close to that. Um, it depends on the classes you're taking and things like that. So those top three things are what we call our direct costs. So those are things that everyone is going to have to pay for. The things at the bottom, those are the indirect costs. So those are things that may vary year to year um, or vary person to person. The estimated personal expenses, that's another number that we get from the survey, uh, about $3,300 for the year. And those are things that we include for like transportation, cleaning supplies, toothpaste, shampoo, those just day-to-day -day living expenses that no matter where you're living or going to school, you're going to have to purchase those things somehow. Obviously, there are things that will not be on your university bill, but are things that are just out of pocket that maybe you have money saved up for, which is great, um, or maybe you need some extra loan money to help with those things. So we do allow financial aid to help cover those personal expenses. And then the laptop computer, that's a mandatory, mandatory purchase coming in your first year. It's a computer that'll last you all four years that you're here, um, and it gets added right to your university bill, and we do allow financial aid to help cover that as well. Uh, maybe that's another thing you have some money saved up for. You don't need to use financial aid for it, but we do give you that option. So that total cost of attendance not only represents what we expect the year to cost, but is also the maximum in financial aid that you can use. So that's why it's really important, especially going back to the housing and meals, that you're really carefully considering where you're living, um, because if you're living in a single apartment um, that's more expensive than what we budget, we can't increase your financial aid to help cover that. Um, so that's why those numbers are very important. You're living within those means. I'll talk about making a budget and making a plan to pay, um, because we cannot increase your financial aid above those two numbers at the bottom. So planning to pay the bill. So plan to pay for those costs that we just mentioned. The first key is going to be to file the FAFSA. So the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid. If you filed the FAFSA for previous years as an undergraduate student, the process looks very similar. The one main difference is as a graduate or professional student, you automatically become independent uh, for FAFSA purposes, which means we no longer need your parent information on the FAFSA. Um, so you'll file the FAFSA log in there. Um, if you've already filed the FAFSA previously, you'll use your same FSA ID and password, get logged in. Um, it'll ask you through the demographics what degree you plan to pursue. And then as soon as you tell it, you're going to become a graduate professional student that says, okay, you're independent. We don't need parent information. So we'll just ask for your 2016 tax information for both you and if you're married, your spouse would be on there as well. If you didn't file taxes in 2016, that's fine. That's a box you can check as well. The one exception to that parent information, there's a unique loan for vet med students. It's called the Health Professional Student Loans. You can see there HPSL. That loan is um, dispersed by Health and Human Services, the Department of Health and Human Services, and they require parent information on the FAFSA in order to be considered for that loan. Usually that loan isn't a very large amount, depends on the funding that we have. But the nice thing with that loan that it is interest free while you're in school. So all graduate and professional students are only eligible for unsubsidized federal loans. And those are the ones that are always accruing interest. The one exception for vet med students is this HPSL loan. So by including parent information, it'll go through a financial need check and you may be eligible for this loan. So if that's something you're interested in seeing if you qualify for, you'll add parent information. Even though the FAFSA tells you it's not needed, you'll say, yes, I still want to include it. Including that parent information will not affect anything else except your eligibility for that loan. So it won't hurt anything. Um, so it's always a good idea to try just to see if you may be eligible. Um, the deadline to file the FAFSA is March 1st, 2018, if you want to be considered for that HPSL loan. Um, and if you're considering multiple schools or haven't made up your mind quite yet, um, include as many schools as you want on the FAFSA, file it by March 1st, and it'll be sent to all the schools. Um, that doesn't hurt anything either. 
If you know you don't want to be considered for that loan for whatever reason, or if you're unable to provide parent information, you can file the FAFSA at any date and you'll just be considered for the unsubsidized loan. So that would be okay too. Um, we still encourage you to get that done as soon as possible, just so your financial aid goes through on time. Um, you will get a financial aid award letter mailed to you in May. Um, it'll show you the aid that's going to be available to you. And I'll show you those aid options here on the next slide. That's when you'll see the loan amounts, if you're eligible for HPSL, those kind of things. Um, it'll also be available in your Access Plus account, which is gonna be your portal online to all things Iowa State. So that's where you can check it as well. Uh, like I mentioned before, your financial aid award will not exceed that cost of attendance that we looked at the previous slide. And all of your financial aid steps will be completed online. And I'll talk a little bit about those here in a moment. But if you've borrowed federal loans in the past, maybe subsidized or unsubsidized loans, good chances are that you've completed a lot of the necessary steps. There's a few other ones, but they can be completed online or fairly easy to do. So we'll look here the different types of financial aid. So as an undergraduate student, you may have used a subsidized loan, a Pell Grant, um, other institutional grants, um, but unfortunately, as a graduate professional student, the only aid is really gonna be some loan options. Uh, so we'll look at some of those. Um, the loan options will be listed on your financial aid award. Um, you can always reduce, decline, or accept those up to finals week each semester. Um, the university bill, though, is due the beginning of each semester. So if you need the aid to cover your bill, I would recommend accepting it earlier on. Um, and then maybe if you decide you need a little bit extra for housing, we can always make those adjustments later on in the semester. The loans are not, um, they don't require payments until after you graduate or stop attending or enrolled less than half time. If you borrowed loans as an undergraduate student or in a previous graduate program, those loans should be deferred while you're in school. So those payments are not gonna be required once you re-enter school. Um, your loan servicer should know this automatically, but sometimes they miss the memo on that. So you may need to reach out to them and tell them that you're back in school, and then they can advise you of the necessary steps to complete so you can stop making payments on any loans that you may have been making that payments on before you re-entered school. These are the types of loans that typically are available to students who have the fast on file. The unsubsidized loan um, is very similar to the unsubsidized loan you may be borrowing now as an undergraduate student. Just by filing the FAFSA, you should get that eligibility and parent information is not required for that loan. That is a loan that's completely under your name as a student, it's not tied to anyone else. The gradu um, graduate or veterinary plus loan, this loan is a little bit different because it does require a separate, separate application. Um, this one, it is credit-based. Only our out-of-state students will need this. Um, for our in-state students, that unsubsidized loan can be enough to cover that full cost. For our non-residents, you may need to look at the Graduate PLUS loan. And I'll show you the details of the differences in here in a moment. And then the HPSL loan, that one, it's eligible. Non-residents and residents are eligible for it just by filing the FAFSA by March 1st and including parent information. It is also need-based, so not everyone who does those two things qualify, but it's definitely a good idea to see if you qualify that first year, definitely, with the parent information. So these are the different types of loans. So we'll start with the unsubsidized loan. Um, as an undergraduate student, you may have remembered that annual limit is usually 5,500, 6,500, or 7,500, depending on your year. As you can see, it goes up to 40,500 uh, for veterinary students because the cost obviously is higher. The interest rate is currently fixed at 6% with an origination fee of 1%. Um, the origination fee basically, if you accepted that full 40,500, 1% less than that would actually get applied to your bill because of that processing fee. Um, that's the same for loans you may have taken out as an undergraduate student as well. Um, the interest rate is fixed every July 1, um, so every year it may change, but whatever you take out that loan at, that's the interest rate it will be at for the lifetime of the loan. So you may end up with four different loans with four different interest rates, but they're going to be fixed. Um, in order to qualify for the unsubsidized loans, you just want to get that FAFSA on file and then follow your acceptance steps for the loans in Access Plus. Repayment doesn't begin until six months after graduation. The Graduate Plus loan, like I mentioned, just for the remaining costs for our non-resident students. Um, so kind of doing the math there, you would use that full unsubsidized loan and then fill in that gap, whatever else is needed with that plus loan up to the cost of attendance. If you needed the full thing, 
If you only needed a thousand dollars of the PLUS loan, that's okay too. You have complete control over how much you apply for or accept on any of these loans. Um, the interest rate is a little bit higher for the PLUS loan, so that's why it's better to avoid it or borrow um, the least amount if possible. Filing the FAFSA, doing the loan application, and then signing the master promissory note or the loan agreement is what you would need to do for that PLUS loan. Um, the repayment on the PLUS loan, it says it starts immediately after graduation, but there is a place on the application to check that you want it to be deferred. So you can check that, no, you don't want to make any payments until after graduation, and then it'll be deferred just like your unsubsidized loan. And then the health professionals loan, the amount, like I mentioned before, it varies depending on the student, depending on the funding that we have for it that year. Um, it is interest-free, 0% there while the student's in school, and it will continue to be interest-free till one year after graduation. Um, that loan also does not begin payments until one year, 12 months after you graduate. So a little bit longer grace period is what it's called with the HPSL loan, which is nice as well. Uh, but in order to qualify, like I said, filing the FAFSA with parent information by March 1st, and then we'll look at your financial need and then determine if you qualify. So for the financial aid disbursement, um, financial aid disperses about one week before classes begin each semester. Um, so for the fall, it disperses about a week before classes in August. And in the spring, it goes through about a week before classes in January. Any aid that you have will automatically go towards your university bill first and cover any cost that's on your U bill. So usually your tuition fees, that laptop purchase that I mentioned, um, any course fees or textbooks that you may have charged your U bill. And then after that is paid, any extra money would come back to you in the form of a financial aid refund. So like I mentioned, the housing costs and personal expenses Together, those um, equal about $12,000 for the year. So if you use your financial aid up to that full amount, you may get about $6,000 back to you in a financial aid refund. And that's money that you can use for that semester to cover your rent, your groceries, any other day-to-day -day expenses that you have. Um, as long as you've done all those financial aid steps, that's when the financial aid goes through, pays your U-bill, you can see the deadline there, August 20th for the fall bill, January 20th for your spring bill. Um, as long as the steps are done, your financial aid should go through and cover the bill by those due dates. Uh, there are some monthly payment plans that you can explore. Those are through our accounts receivable office or our billing office. So if you want to pay monthly on your U-bill, there are some options to do that. You can use that in conjunction with loans to help reduce your loan balance. If you're able to do that, that's definitely a good idea. Um, you want to be checking your U-bill every month. Um, although the majority of things get added at the beginning of the semester, there's still small things that get added on throughout the semester. So additional course fees, you have to go to the health center, um, parking tickets, things like that. Those get added on a monthly basis. So you may be responsible for some of those um, monthly expenses if you're charging things to your U-bill throughout the semester. So planning to live like a student. So this is the area that I really focus on in the student loan education office. So really being prepared for the cost and your day-to-day -day living expenses. Um, so hopefully maybe many of you have been working on the budget as an undergraduate student or um, as a professional and different graduate programs, but that's going to be very important in vet school. Um, not only to reduce your loan debt, but just to be in control of your spending, start saving for some of those financial goals you may have, keep your bar keeping your borrowing to a minimum. So really working on that budgeting piece is gonna be important. Um, you wanna keep track of those things that are listed there. So cell phone payments, Netflix, car insurance, car payments, medication, all of those things that you know usually come on a monthly basis or even things that come every six months or so. You really wanna budget those in so you can be be prepared for some of those expenses, maybe like car insurance, maybe it's due every six months. You wanna make sure you're aware of that so you have the money set aside to cover that. Um, making it a goal to plan to pay for these things without using student loans would be ideal. Uh, if you have some money saved up or many students choose to work over the summer or even part-time as a student, that's something I really encourage you to talk to the student panel with um, or ask questions to if you sit on that webinar Many students are able to work part-time in school if that means doing some, participating in some research opportunities with different professors, 
or other opportunities they may find at the college or other places at Ames as well. Um, but if you're able to work even a couple hours a week to pay for some of those day-to-day -day expenses, that'll help you out in the long run. Um, Stay, working over the summer is important as well. Some students choose to study abroad, other experiences, which is great. Um, but if you're not doing some of those things, working over the summer and getting some extra income um, to bring back to school is helpful. Um, shopping on consignment, shopping, looking for deals and coupons, any little thing that you can do to save money is definitely gonna be helpful. Um, and then planning to pay for your direct expenses um, with student loans if you're not able to pay out of pocket. Um, so like I mentioned before, that budgeted amount for living expenses, it comes out to about $9.75 a month to cover living expenses. So that's gonna be your rent and for your groceries. Definitely very manageable to find a place in Ames, close to the vet school even, that you can live within that budget. Uh, find new roommates, um, living with friends, family members, um, whoever you're able to, to make sure that you're within that budget and really cut those down to, to look at the minimum there. Um, there's a food pantry on campus, so if you need some help with groceries, there's a lot of good resources that you can use just by being a college student. Uh, we have the SciRide bus system, which will take you a lot of places all over Ames. So taking advantage of that, not using your car when you're able to, just to save in, in, a various, in various different ways. Um, some frequently asked questions here. Um, can you get in-state tuition if you're not from Iowa? Um, this is determined by the Office of the Registrar. Um, typically, if you, become, if, you're, if you come in as a non-resident, you're gonna stay as a non-resident all four years. Um, if you have more detailed questions about that, I really encourage you to reach out to the Office of the Registrar. Um, because of your enrollment requirements in the college, typically it's not possible to go through the residency process. But like I said, if you, want, if you have questions, you can reach out to the registrar. Um, grants and scholarships. Um, grants, unfortunately, are not funded for professional students. Um, like you may have received the Pell Grant or any kind of institutional grants. Um, once you become a professional graduate student, unfortunately, those are not available. But there are some scholarships to the college. Um, your first year, you're automatically be considered for those based on your application to admis for admissions. And then for each year after that, you'll get an email about a scholarship application through the college that you'll fill out to be considered for scholarships for years two, three, and four. Um, there's also outside scholarships that you can definitely look for through different programs you're a part of or employers or organizations, all of those things are definitely, um, you're encouraged to do that as well. And then um, you cannot get more money for living expenses as a commonly asked question. I'm um, going back to that budgeting piece of it. That's why it's gonna be really important to make sure that you're living within those means. Um, the exceptions to that, if you are coming with children that you're supporting and paying for childcare, we may be able to increase your financial aid to help cover for some of those expenses. If you're choosing to live outside of Ames and commuting to school, uh, we may be able to increase your eligibility there. Um, so those are the main um, exceptions to that. If those things may be true for you, then we may be able to increase your aid. And really it's just increasing your loan eligibility. So there won't be any additional grants or, things, or scholarships available, um, but you may get some more loan eligibility if some of those things apply to you. Um, so here is our website. This directs you to our financial aid website. And then there's a tab that says veterinary medicine student. And once you click on that, it'll take you to the financial aid page unique for veterinary medicine students and it will show you the different aid types the cost kind of like what i just summarized today it's all on that website um, and then that email there both tara and i check that um, daily so feel free to email us with any questions or give us a call as well we'd be happy to answer those um, but now we have some time um, for questions you may have now so feel free to type in that q a box and i will answer those as best i can I see the first one that came in here. Um, if you've taken out loans for a graduate program already, will this affect your ability to take out federal loans? Um, typically, the answer to that is no. Um, there is a aggregate, um, aggregate federal loan limit, um, but it's fairly high for veterinary medicine students. So most people have not reached that limit. Um, but if you are concerned, you can always reach out to me and we can look at your loan history together and determine if you are close to that. Okay, lots of questions coming in. Let's see. So you can say answer live and then it'll go 
clear that question out. Oh, okay. Yep. Perfect. And then done. And then done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we have a question. Uh, this one says, I know a few universities are able to increase the cost of attendance for first years from moving expenses. Is ISU able to do that? Um, unfortunately not. Uh, we cannot increase your aid for that first year for moving expenses. So that'll, something, that'll be something you'll have to plan for, um, save up for over the summer, um, or know that when you get your financial aid refund in the fall, that maybe you have to reimburse yourself for some of those things, but then you have to be living off less money for that semester. So really that's something that you'll wanna plan for without financial aid. It's a good question. Um, are scholarships awarded at the same time as other financial aid, such as loans? Um, yes, those scholarships should be on your financial aid award letter that you get in May. Um, most of those decisions have been made at that time. Um, so if you were awarded any scholarships, you should see it when you get your financial aid award letter. And the same thing going forward um, for years two, three, and four, typically that financial aid award letter is available the previous April. So you would get it in April and your next school year would start in August. So that's when you would get your new financial aid award letter that would show any new scholarships you're eligible for and, those, and that loan eligibility as well. I believe, sorry, <laughs> I'm going to cut in. Um, I believe Kathy was talking about um, when those um, offers go out for you guys um, next week, that information on scholarships should be in there um, or it should be arriving pretty soon after that. Um, just so that you guys can have that information as you choose the um, College of Veterinary Medicine that you're going to. So, um, so you'll have a little bit of that information, but then more information will come out in the spring when it gets closer to that. So, perfect. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, has anyone in the past? Has anyone in the past who is out of state been able to receive in-state tuition? Um, there's a few that has specific ties to military benefits. Um, is the only one that I can think of. Um, or if someone has a spouse who's living in Iowa full-time, working full-time, and you're moving to live with the spouse and happen to be going to veterinary school, I've seen that happen. Um, but other than that, unfortunately, there's not a lot a lot of opportunities to to make that switch. Um, is it possible to ob obtain an athletic scholarship to an varsity team while completing veterinary medicine? That's a good question. I do not know. Do you know of anyone who's had that? I, I don't and I'm not sure if it's because of the schedule of vet men and how that might may line up sorry, might line up with a uh, athletic schedule, um, but uh, let me write that down. Let's see, um, Patrick. Okay, let me write that down and I'll get back to you just okay. to see. Yeah, good question. Um, are there summer jobs that the College of Vet Med offers for vet students? That's another good question. Um, I believe there are some. Um, some research opportunities are the main ones that I've seen students take advantage of working for various faculty members and working on various research projects. Um, there is a job board that we have on our Access Plus that is kind of the portal to all things Iowa State that has jobs listed there as well. But I bet your best opportunity for that would really to be to make some connections with different faculty members and see if you can make some kind of partnership or um, get into any research opportunities that they may be working on. Um, does the financial aid include courses taken over the summer? Um, yes. Um, typically, you're not taking classes between your first and second or second and third year. Um, but if you do take classes, if they're counting toward your degree or study abroad trips are usually the most common, then yes, financial aid can be used to cover those. Um, there is the mandatory summer after your third year that transitions into your fourth year, basically. So from May all the way through the following May when you graduate, um, you'll be busy with classes then, and we do create a separate summer financial aid package to help cover those classes and really more of those rotation experiences or practical experiences that you may be doing. So yes. 
Um, are there are there work opportunities available on campus as a licensed veterinary technician, um, or would you need to look outside of campus? I believe most of those would be off campus opportunities. Um, like I mentioned, most of the ones on campus or through the school are more research based. Um, definitely in camp, um, off campus, though, in different um, clinics around Ames, those definitely would be good places to look. Um, what happens if you get late, if you get waitlisted, would you still recommend filing the FAFSA? Yes, um, absolutely. I would say, even now, as you don't know what your result is um, on your application, go ahead and file that FAFSA and include as many schools as you would like. You include up to 10 different schools. Um, so if you do with that acceptance letter, um, then we'll have your, your, we'll have your FAFSA ready to go to create that financial aid award letter um, that goes true for any school. So it doesn't hurt to file the FAFSA for any school that you're considering. Do most students work during the school year? Are there lots of opportunities for students? Um, there are definitely lots of opportunities for students. Um, it depends on your time management skills um, and opportunities you may have there. I think that's a really good question for the student panel because they have obviously that real life experience of going to school and working. Um, I think it's definitely possible, definitely requires some skill of, of um, creating a schedule, manage your time, um, but there are lots of opportunities. Um, some of the vet school, but also other places in Ames or on our main um, Iowa State campus. Um, if a parent accepts a job in Iowa, does one qualify as an in-state student? Um, it really depends on the timing of that one. So that's when I'll definitely encourage you to reach out to the registrar's office um, because based on when the parents move, when the job starts, a whole number of things, um, it could be possible, um, but definitely reaching out to the registrar's office to kind of talk more details is something that I would recommend. Are there any fees, such as lab fees, not included in the estimates provided earlier? Um, some of the classes may have some additional fees, um, usually not very many, usually they're included in the tuitions that we estimated. Um, there could be some, like I mentioned, that come up depending on the classes you're taking, taking but usually they're not very substantial. Um, terms of work at the College of Vet Med. Um, I'm not really sure if you want to clarify that question. Um, I mean, the college doesn't restrict you how many hours you can work, it's really based on what you're able to work. Um, maybe that's what you mean by the question, but feel free to follow up and, and add a little more details, please. If the financial aid packages are being sent to us in May, wouldn't it be difficult to decide if ISU CVM is affordable and we're able to make an informed decision by the 15th of April? Um, you mentioned the scholarships will be mm -hmm. sent out. Yeah. So like Deanna mentioned, the scholarships, it sounds like a majority of them will be sent out to you before then, which is helpful. Um, and then you can use that maybe to make your decision, but also then knowing that as long as you have that FAFSA on file, those unsubsidized loans and graduate plus loans, if you're a non-resident, will be available to you. Um, so using that scholarship information you'll get here um, in the next in the next couple of weeks or couple of months. And then knowing that if that FAFSA is on file, if you're eligible to file the FAFSA, most, most students are, then those loans should be an option for you. And then in Iowa, do you have to be a licensed vet tech to work as a tech in the clinic? I don't know the answer <laughs> to that one. Um, we can look into mm -hmm. it. Um, oh, it says in the yes. Yep. We can definitely look into that. Um, yeah, so uh, because it's, it's answer or it's asked anonymously, um, if you want to, my email address is d-g-e-r-b-e-r -E -E at iastate.edu, um, or just reply back to actually the webinar invitation, that first one that you got. Um, I will look into that for you um, and kind of follow up. Um, or if you want to submit it with uh, submit the question again with your name, um, I'll go ahead and write it down. But um, 
I'm not sure. I know each state has their own regulations um, as far as if you have to be, if you have to have a license um, or not. So um, I will absolutely double check that for you. But um, if you can just either shoot me an email with that question um, or go ahead and write it in the Q&A box once again um, with your name attached to it, that would be great. So thanks. Okay, the next question. How long does it typically take to pay off student loans for an out-of-state student? That's a good question. Um, if you're borrowing that about $60,000 a year for four years, about $240,000, typically what most students choose is a income-driven repayment plan. Um, studentloans.gov is a really good resource if you wanna estimate what some payments may look like. Really encourage you, if you've already borrowed loans, hopefully you're using that tool, but if you haven't borrowed loans yet, that's a really good tool to use because it walks you through the different repayment plan options. Um, the income-driven plans are usually the most um, popular, especially for our non-resident students. They are over a 20 or 25 year time frame, and then the payments are gonna be directly correlated to how much you're actually earning. So the payments can increase every year if your income increases or decreases, it works the same way. Um, so most students choose that plan and will be on that plan for the full 20 or 25 years. And then after that time, so if you were to be on the plan for that 20 or 25 year mark and the whole loan wasn't paid off, which is true for many students, then the remainder of that loan debt will be forgiven, uh, but then the IRS turns around and counts as taxable income on your taxes for the following year. So it sounds more confusing than it really is, um, but that's the plan for many students to be on that plan, paying the minimum payment based on their income, which is usually very affordable, and then saving up for those 20 or 25 years. So when the IRS says, okay, you're done paying, we'll turn it into taxable income, whatever's left over, you have that money saved up to pay that larger income tax that year. That's usually the most popular method. Um, if you have extra money, if you wanna pay it back earlier and not wait for that forgiveness at the end, that's definitely an option. It really depends on your starting salary, um, what you're able to pay every month. So that's one of the things that I help a lot with the college is sitting down with students and looking at, okay, here's your projected loan debt, here's what your starting salary is expected to be. Let's decide on what payment plan may work best. Um, but as of now, that's kind of the most popular one. There are some loan forgiveness programs that I would definitely encourage you to explore some states offer loan forgiveness if you work in a shortage area in the state. So looking into those, and although it may not be your ideal career to work in a rural, rural part of some, of some state, they may offer to pay back a good portion of your loans by doing so. So exploring that through the military as well, if you sign up to work as a vet in the army, there are different loan forgiveness um, or repayment plans you could choose for them. And all those are listed on our financial aid website under that veterinary medicine tab as well. So you can explore some of those options, even now while you're still open to different careers, looking at those and seeing if those may benefit you, especially the out-of-state students um, who may find that loan debt a little bit difficult to pay off. Um, does that forgiveness plan hurt your credit score? No, it does not. Um, that forgiveness is part of the loan repayment. So you're making those payments every month on time, that's actually helping to build your credit. So as long as you're making payments on time and then you pay back the IRS at the end with that tax bill, your credit won't be damaged at all. For FAFSA, what tax year are we supposed to fill out the application? That's a good question. Um, the FAFSA recently changed. Um, in previous years, they were looking at the prior year. So people were trying to file their taxes and file the FAFSA all at the same time. They got really confusing. So now the FAFSA looks back two years prior. So this current year that's gonna start in August, the 2018, 2019 school year, is gonna look at 2016 income. Um, so you'll put 2016 income, and the idea was to make it easier for families because hopefully by this point, everyone has filed their 2016 taxes. Um, so that's the informa information we want you to input into that 18, 19 FAFSA. We don't want you to update it to be 2017. Uh, we don't want you to make that update even after you filed your taxes. We want it to stay at 2016. That's a good question. Oh, that was the end of the questions. Any other questions that I can answer for you?
So as, as people are, you know, maybe furiously uh, writing, um, typing away, um, I just wanted to take a second and thank you guys for logging on. Um, it's, I hope this was a great information um, gathering time for you. Um, I'll follow up and send out an email um, with a couple of the links, um, like the financial aid website link, um, and a couple of those just to, to kind of make sure that you guys have clickable links um, so that you don't have to, you know, kind of Google. Um, but it looks like we may have one last question here. Last question, it looks like, what is the school code for FAFSA, so the Iowa State Code 001869. 001869. You can also search, if you did write it down, that's okay. You can search Iowa State University, and Iowa State University of Science and Technology. So sometimes that, that confuses people, um, but that is us. So you can either search us or put in that, that code I just mentioned. Perfect, well, thanks again, you guys. Um, like I said, uh, we've got that, um, the big week next week, you guys get to hear from us um, about your status. Um, we'll have that um, financial aid student panel. So we um, actually have a, a student from each of our four years to kind of talk to you about their experiences. Um, I'm gonna ask them to share what, what February 15th was like for them when they um, got the, got the, um, a letter of admission or the letter that saying that they're on the wait list for um, Iowa State and kind of their journey. So um, tune in. I'll send out a, a registration for that um, tomorrow. So thanks, you guys. Thanks, Julia. Yeah. <laughs>